Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about in this lecture is nature's Olympians. And by nature's Olympians, I mean uh, creatures who have physical capacities that are far beyond the uh, normal range that you have for even uh, elite human athletes. And so uh, the reason for doing that really is that it gives us a good opportunity to test the models that we use to test athletes in extreme circumstances. And it also reflects back on the kind of performance limitations that humans normally have both in a high performance context, in health and in disease as well. I mean, another reason for doing this, of course, is that comparing animals is absolutely fascinating, but it's not easy. And one of the reasons for that is size differences. And I'm really not going to talk much about scaling for those size differences, although there's a whole field of research on that. But you can see from this particular figure that the size of animals varies by several orders of magnitude from the bacterium to the blue whale. And what you see here is a sculpture of a blue whale's heart. And one of the sculptors is putting the finishing touches to that model. Um, and he's doing that by gaining access through the blue whale's aorta, the main artery leaving the heart. So you could, in principle, swim through uh, blue whale's aorta, or that'd be the, the most extreme caving experience ever. And of course, that's uh, a tetrapod inside the heart of another tetrapod. And there are, of course, uh, other creatures with very different body plans. So trying to compare, for example, a human with a spider in terms of performance is very, very difficult. But I'm going to try and uh, achieve that using uh, a, a particular type of model. We also ought to remember that there are various ways of moving around the world. So we have terrestrial locomotion, um, as exemplified here by the dog on four legs, but we can obviously have two-legged locomotion, bipedalism in humans. There can be uh, four-legged locomotion, six-legged locomotion, even five-legged locomotion, if you take into account uh, a slow-moving uh, kangaroo. And then you have flight in insects, birds, and mammals. We also have slithering in snakes, uh, brachial locomotion in monkeys and uh, other apes. And then, of course, swimming in aquatic species. And not just swimming, here we also have some squid, which can perform jet propulsion as well. And then finally, we have peristaltic motion in earthworms. So there are all sorts of ways of moving around, but all of those ways are essentially limited by the same factors. And when we think about human performance, we come across the speed duration problem. And in humans, of course, athletic performance is a complex expression of social, psychological, biomechanical, uh, and physiological characteristics of the athlete in particular. But ultimately, your ability to run, swim, row, cycle, or anything else is limited by energy transfer processes. So the maximum rate at which you can supply and resynthesize ATP will determine your maximal exercising speed, no matter what uh, modality you're using. And animals share that same limitation. Very broadly speaking, there's the anaerobic side of the equation using high energy phosphate compounds that releases energy very, very quickly, but the stores of that energy is very, very small. And so as a result, that's what we use for sprint events. And then on the other side of that, we have the aerobic energy system, oxidative energy transfer, and that acts relatively slowly, but be, can be sustained for very long durations. And that's what we use in endurance events. And the balance between those two extremes can be described using the speed duration relationship. And the speed duration relationship was perhaps encapsulated best and first by A.V. Hill in 1925. Uh, A.V. Hill's a Nobel laureate who um, did seminal work on the thermodynamics of muscular contraction, but he also had an interest in athletics. And so what he did in 1925 in his Nature paper was simply plot the world records of the day in various exercise modalities and fit a curve to them. And what you see is for sprint events, the, the speeds are very high. So we've got two scales here for swimming and for uh, running. And you can see each of these curves follows essentially the same pattern, whether you're swimming, running, uh, rowing, or what have you. Also note, of course, that women running only goes up to about two minutes. And that's because back in those days, women 
were forbidden from racing more than 800 meters for absolutely no good reason. But this characteristic curve shape falls away, but then starts to plateau in what we mathematically would term an asymptote. And we use this model in the laboratory today to characterize athletes as well. And this speed duration relationship is usually measured in this way. So here we have a typical club runner with a critical speed, as we call it, 4.3 meters per second, and a D prime of 287 meters. Now, how do we get to that? Well, first of all, we have to do some laboratory assessment. So we do three to five exhaustive runs at a fixed speed until the participant can no longer keep pace with the treadmill. We usually select these to last approximately two to 15 minutes, and then we plot them on the graph and fit a curve to them. And that curve has two parameters. The first is the critical speed, and the second is the curvature constant uh, D prime. Now the critical speed is theoretically the maximum sustainable speed, and that's what we might call our aerobic parameter. And that's given by this dotted line. So as the curve approaches infinity, we have the critical speed parameter. And then we have the distance prime or D prime parameter, and that's a fixed distance that can be performed above the critical speed. And you might liken that to an anaerobic parameter. The interesting thing about D prime is this. Let's say you wanted to run at eight meters per second. How long would you be able to do that? And the answer is uh, just around about a minute. If you wanted to run at six meters per second, how long would that take? Uh, around about three minutes. And then if you wanted to run at five meters per second, well, that would take uh, more than six minutes before you were forced to slow down um, because of these two parameters. So the interesting thing about each of these rectangles is they're the same area. They all represent D prime. So 287 meters of extra uh, distance can be performed above the critical speed, no matter how fast you do it. Now, the critical speed itself also has interesting physiological correlates, and that's related to what happens when you exercise above and below the critical speed. So here we have the oxygen uptake response. And for those unfamiliar in the laboratory, we measure oxygen uptake with a mouthpiece and a nose clip in this case, or sometimes a face mask. And we're measuring the expired air and then calculating how much oxygen is taken up by the lung. And so from an, an unloaded pedaling on a cycle ergometer, we then impose a power output that, that in this case is 93% of critical power. And I just point out that critical power is the cycling version of critical speed. So we're not working at a speed now, we're working at a power. But below the critical power, we can achieve a steady state oxygen uptake. But above the critical power, we can't. You can see the VO2 response carries on rising until it reaches a ceiling value. This ceiling value is called the maximal oxygen uptake or the VO2 max. And it's not just oxygen uptake in which this happens. Pretty much every metabolically relevant variable behaves in this way. And so we can also measure this for uh, the lactate concentration in the blood below the critical power reaches a steady state. It doesn't above the critical power. And if we go into the muscle and measure muscle lactate, we can achieve a steady state below the critical power, but not above the critical power. So critical power or critical speed is also an important metabolic and indeed a fatigue threshold. So armed with that information, what we're now going to do is the exciting bit and start talking about animals. And we're going to start with terrestrial locomotion. So who is the terrestrial champion in terms of locomotion? And I'm first going to ask the question, is it the horse? Is this the supreme animal athlete? And you can see from this figure that the horse has been bred for more than 300 years for athletic performance in the case of the thoroughbred uh, or the quarter horse. And you can see this racehorse straining every sinew to gallop as fast as it possibly can. You can probably also see underneath uh, the saddle there, you can see uh, sweat appearing. So horses are also um, having to generate an awful lot of heat and also remove an awful lot of heat. But how do we go about determining whether or not the horse is the supreme animal athlete? And we start with laboratory measurements. Now, as I've already explained, if we're in the laboratory with a human, we can measure gas exchange and uh, oxygen uptake using uh, a gas analyzer uh, attached to a mouthpiece. So these wires go off to the gas analyzer off screen. 
We can essentially do the same thing with the horse. It's just the equipment needs to be bigger. And so this is an equine treadmill. And you can see here is the horse's mouthpiece. And what's happening here is there's air being drawn past the, the horse's nostrils. And then the way in which the horse breathes out and essentially dilutes that gas, we can then calculate oxygen uptake from it. You can also probably see there are some lines going into the jugular vein so we can measure blood temperature and blood lactate and other parameters we can draw from the blood. And that's what one of these technicians in the background is doing. Uh, you can tell this is a treadmill in the United States because there's a, a technician wearing a peaked cap on backwards. But we can use this and you can see that the treadmill is uh, also inclined so that we can try and limit the speed because otherwise the, the, the horse might outrun the treadmill. But we can use this to try and understand why the horse is able to gallop as fast as it does. And there are a number of reasons. So the first thing to point out is that the horse's uh, body mass is taken, about 50% of it is taken up by skeletal muscle. That contains about 20 litres of mitochondria, the powerhouses of the cell, and perhaps as much as 200,000 kilometres of capillaries. So there's a huge sink to consume oxygen inside the muscle in the horse and a very dense capillary network to supply the oxygen to the periphery. But to get it there, you need a pump. And the horse is endowed with a very large heart, about twice the size in relative terms as the human heart. And it also has a very large heart rate range. So a maximal heart rate in a horse is 230 to 240 beats per minute, as opposed to a young human, which might be as much as 200 beats per minute. So the heart beats rapidly and it has a very large stroke volume. The horse has another trick in terms of oxygen delivery, and that's the spleen. It's able to contract its spleen and increase its hemoglobin concentration by about 50%. In other words, during high intensity exercise, the horse blood dopes itself in order to increase uh, oxygen transport. But it's not all good news because we think the horse is lung limited. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, the horse is an obligate nasal breather. So it has to breathe through its nostrils. Um, and it also can only breathe once per stride because its stomach contents will impinge upon the diaphragm as it lands on its front hooves and its entire stomach contents move forward. So those of you who've ridden a horse and, and cantered and galloped a horse will note that the horse will breathe once per stride. Whilst that's happening, there's huge pressure swings inside the lung um, and as a result of that, you've got very high cardiac output, you've got short transit times for red blood cells, potential diffusion limitation. And as a result, the, the horse often desaturates during high intensity exercise. But more worrying, of course, is the pressure swings, and that can cause a rupture of the blood gas barrier. So the horse can actually bleed into its lungs during high intensity exercise. And to try and mitigate that, uh, there are various ways and means, for example, wearing a, a nasal strip to try and increase the, uh, the or try and reduce the uh, resistance in this part of the airway. But nevertheless, all of that taken into account, the horse is still very, very fast. And how fast? Well, what I've done here is I've plotted some English horse racing records alongside the performance of Secretariat in the uh, Kentucky Derby in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And from this, we can calculate critical speed and distance prime. Critical speed, 14.4 meters per second, 10 meters per second faster than a human club runner. But D prime is not that much bigger. It's a little bit bigger, but it's not hugely bigger. And that suggests that the horse is very heavily dependent on aerobic metabolism to sustain high intensity exercise. So that's the horse, very impressive and highly aerobic. But what about other creatures that might be in the same bracket in terms of performance? Well, now we move on to dogs. And we've got the racing greyhound on the left-hand side and uh, sled dogs, huskies, on the right-hand side. We've got the extremes here of sprint and endurance. And the problem with this is we can't really construct the speed duration relationship as we did in horses. And the, the reason for that is that the greyhound races typically last less than a minute, and there's not a great range of race durations in which that takes place because they're running around a single track. And of course, the, the Huskies will race over a thousand kilometers 
and they're also racing in packs pulling a musher so the actual speeds they're able to attain are impressive in terms of human running so they're uh, running faster than humans do but it's difficult to then calculate individual dog performance one interesting thing about huskies though is as the race progresses they become increasingly reliant on uh, carbohydrate metabolism and they seem to undergo gluconeogenesis in the liver from glycerol so they have a high fat diet and they will turn that into carbohydrate this is the complete reverse of how human ultra distance runners work as the race progresses you become more reliant on fat so dogs do it completely differently and arguably better but we can start to try and think about dog performance by comparing back to horses and also humans this was done recently by Senefeld et al in 2021 and so we here we have the historic performance of the Kentucky Derby, the English Derby, and the human 800 meter race performance. And the scales are slightly different, but horses and dogs are pretty similar in terms of speed of those races. But note that Kentucky Derby is at least twice the distance of the English uh, Greyhound Derby. And so from this analysis, you'd suggest that horse critical power is slightly higher than dogs would be. The other thing to note from this is that obviously they're both very much faster than humans, but also humans have um, a difference in the sexes. So females run more slowly than do males. That is not the case for dogs or horses. So there's no sexual diamorphism in terms of performance in these species. And it doesn't seem to be associated with testosterone concentration because the complete removal of the sex organs in both species does not seem to affect performance very much. And so um, both female and male horses and dogs uh, can be competitive in the same races, quite different from humans. But we still haven't reached the champion yet. So I would argue that in terms of terrestrial performance amongst mammals at least, the champion of champions is the pronghorn antelope. The human champion of champions, here we see Eliud Kipchoge next to my long-term collaborator, Andy Jones. Andy Jones's critical speed is not six meters per second, unfortunately for him, but that's what Eliud Kipchoge can do. And that's why he can run a marathon in less than two hours with a little bit of uh, additional help. Now, the pronghorn antelope, it's been measured on a treadmill and it's uh, been uh, studied in the wild. It has an estimated critical speed of approximately 18 meters per second or around 40 miles per hour. What that means is if it was to race over 10,000 meters against Eliud Kipchoge, Eliud Kipchoge would complete the race in about 26, 27 minutes at his best. The pronghorn antelope would beat Eliud Kipchoge by more than a quarter of an hour. So it's an extremely fast animal and you might wonder why. And that's because it used to be predated by the American cheetah. And the pronghorn is now the fastest animal in the Americas, um, and it's, it escaped predation via endurance. And so it is essentially an oxygen transport system on legs. But interestingly, there's no one part of its system that's vastly better than the others. It's all good. And so as a result, the pronghorn antelope has a maximal oxygen uptake of around 300 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Eliud Kipchoge's is around 70 to 75, just to give you some impression of the difference. So that's the champion, uh, the pronghorn. Now let's go in the other direction and think about exercise capacity from a survival in different environments point of view. And Bob Full, a, a scientist from the United States in the 1980s, did an, a wonderful series of studies on various creatures with interesting anatomy and physiology. And one of the things he did was measure endurance capacity in them. And so um, I, I have to thank him for doing that because it's allowed me to then subsequently calculate critical speed in these creatures. So we're gonna start by thinking about breathing through your skin. And cutaneous gas exchange, as it's called, is evolved in several different species. Notably, of course, amphibians, frogs and toads, but also salamanders. And there are a number of advantages to breathing through the skin. First of all, you don't need to evolve or use up space, maintaining specialist gas exchange organs inside the body and supporting structures to move air in and out of the lungs. 
So you don't need to have those muscles and blood vessels in support. You can move the body around and that will help you breathe or you can move the mouth. And you've probably seen characteristically frogs do that. That's part of their breathing cycle. Of course, you can also see frogs do have nostrils. They do have lungs as well, um, but some creatures don't. And I'll come on to that in a moment. Having a uh, cutaneous gas exchange is ideal for creatures with relatively low energy demands. And of course, frogs are very active during the mating season, but often um, are not seen very often outside of that. And so when they're not very active, um, they can reduce their energy demands pretty easily. And cutaneous gas exchange works very well for them, particularly in cold conditions. There are some distinct disadvantages, though, of course. Um, the skin needs to be thin, it needs to stay moist, and it needs to be filled with blood vessels. There's also a much lower surface area for gas exchange through the skin than having a set of lungs. So human lungs, if you stretch them out, will cover the area of about half a tennis court, whereas your own body surface area is uh, only a few meters squared. It's therefore very difficult through only cutaneous gas exchange to raise oxygen supply enough to sustain high intensity activity. And this is exemplified by one of uh, Bob Fall's studies, uh, the lungless salamander. And as the name implies, the salamander is only able to breathe through its skin. It essentially hangs around in leaf litter. Um, and it's got a critical speed calculated from Bob Fall's work of about 2.6 centimeters per second, but actually quite an impressive uh, distance prime in relation to that of about 10 meters. So it's able to go 10 meters uh, above its critical speed, no matter um, how fast or slow it does that. Now, that's very interesting, but what does that actually mean in terms of physiological responses? Well, if you actually measure the oxygen uptake and the uh, lactate response in the lungless salamander, as Bob Fall did by putting the salamander in a lucite chamber and measuring the gases that were emanating from it, um, you don't actually see a great deal of difference in the oxygen uptake response qualitatively between a salamander and a human. The only difference is the oxygen uptake response is much smaller in relative terms, but also much slower. But the blood lactate responses here are exactly as you would see, uh, sorry, whole body lactate in this case, exactly as you'd see for a human. So below the critical speed, you attain a steady state. And here are two speeds above the critical speed where you simply don't. So the point here is, even though the lungless salamander and humans are separated by very, very uh, long durations of evolution, the same performance model can be used to understand them. Given that, let's start to look at another champion. I'd just like you to think, and this is not an interactive phase of, of this presentation, but think who you think the world's best middle distance runner is. Historically, you might say Roger Bannister, or you might say Seb Poe, Steve Ovet, Steve Cram, some of the great British milers of the day. You might even go so far as to say Hisham El Garouge, um, the current mile world record holder. Uh, it's none of those, however, you'll be unsurprised to learn. It's actually this creature, the painted ghost crab. And that might come as some surprise that you're seeing the world's best middle distance run at the moment. And you might wonder why it is a crab would have that title. Now, obviously, that's a middle distance runner running sideways, but there are certain things about the crab that would make this claim highly unlikely. Um, obviously, crabs um, are semi-aquatic. They can exist in, um, in water and in air. Uh, the painted ghost crab tends to run around very rapidly in air. So it's an aerobic crab in that sense. But crab anatomy is not really conducive to very good aerobic performance. And there's a reason for that. And that's because here we have the cardiovascular structure in a mammal. So this is exactly as your cardiovascular system would be, a four-chambered double-sided heart with uh, uh, circulation going to the lung, back to the left side of the heart, and then into the systemic circulation, into arterioles, into capillaries, into venules, into veins, and back to the right side of the heart again. That's a closed system. The crabs is totally different. It's an open system with a single chambered heart. And by open, what I mean by that is that the heart pumps blood out through some well-constructed uh, arteries. And then the capillaries at the end of the process are actually open-ended. And so the blood in a crab, which is called hemolymph, bathes the tissues and is then drawn back up 
into a series of sinuses under very low pressure, making its way back to the gills where it's aerated and then sent back to the heart. So not the kind of system, semi-open, it's not the kind of system you'd expect to be conducive to high rates of oxygen consumption. But somehow the ghost crab, crab bucks the trend. Because here is a comparison between the ghost crab and the fiddler crab. The fiddler crab also mentioned by, uh, measured by Bob Full in a separate experiment. You can see the ghost crab has a critical speed of 6.9 centimeters per second, uh, whereas the fiddler crab 3.9. And the D prime in the ghost crab is double that of the fiddler crab, or more than double that of the fiddler crab. So in every respect, the ghost crab is an excellent runner in crab terms. Also, the difference between these two crabs appears to be in the aerobic system. So if you look at the oxygen uptake response in the ghost crab, if you presented this without telling me it was a ghost crab, I wouldn't necessarily know, suggest there was that much difference between this and the human VO2 response. You see it rises rapidly, reaches the steady state, falls rapidly again. Whereas the fiddler crab um, during submaximal exercise cannot attain a steady state. And for some minutes after exercise, oxygen uptake carries on rising before it subsequently falls. This is the hallmark of a very sluggish uh, cardiovascular and respiratory system. So what does that mean in terms of performance? And how would we compare and, and come to the conclusion that the ghost crab is an excellent middle distance runner? And the way we can do that is by using a thing called the endurance parameter ratio, which was introduced by Fukuba and Whip in 1999, but it hasn't been used much since. And all this is, is simply uh, taking D prime and dividing it by the critical speed. And what we've done here is we've taken the club runner we had earlier with a, a critical speed of 4.3 meters per second and D prime of 287 meters and divided one by the other. And that gives us an endurance parameter ratio measured in seconds of 66.7 seconds. That means that this club runner would be able to run at double his critical speed for 66.7 uh, seconds. So to be able to run at 8.6 meters per second for just over a minute before becoming exhausted. And we can use that in other animals because it doesn't matter whether you're measuring it in centimeters per second or meters per second, the animal acts as its own control with this for endurance parameter ratio. So we can validly compare between species without necessarily having to put in, in scaling factors. And when we do that, we produce a graph that looks like this. And so right at the bottom here, we have the uh, exercising racehorse. And you might be quite surprised by that, but that's because the horse is such a good aerobic performer. It's got an extremely high critical speed and as a consequence and a relatively low D prime. And as a consequence of that, it has an uh, endurance parameter ratio of about 18 seconds. So it's, it's able to run at about 30 meters per second, theoretically, for 18 seconds. The human is somewhere in the middle of this relationship, uh, around about 60 to 70 seconds, but by far and away the best is the ghost crab at 470 seconds. So very, very large endurance parameter ratio. We really need to put this into some kind of context so we know how good it is. And to do that, what I'm gonna do is take the club runner we had earlier with the 4.3 meters per second critical speed, and then endow them with the ghost crab's endurance parameter ratio. And when you do that, we have uh, the club runner would be able to run for 470 seconds at eight meters per second. What would that mean in performance terms? Well, it would mean that they would complete one mile in three minutes and seven seconds. That is obviously a world record by about 30 seconds. But they would be able to continue running in the same run and complete 3,000 meters in five minutes and 49 seconds. That is also a world record by about 90 seconds. The runner would be able to carry on at eight meters per second, 8.6 meters per second for another two laps of the track. So two laps of honor at the same speed before they would be forced to slow down if they had the same endurance parameter ratio as a ghost crab. If they had 
uh, Eliud Kipchoge's critical speed of six meters per second. If Eliud Kipchoge had a ghost crab's endurance parameter ratio, he would be able to complete a mile in two minutes and 13 seconds. And we'd all be talking about whether or not the two minute mile was ever going to be possible. So I hope that emphasizes just how good a ghost crab's relative middle distance performance really is. So there we have the middle distance champion of the animal kingdom. Now we're gonna change tack slightly and think about movement through a fluid medium. And we're going to talk obviously about moving through water and moving through air. And we're gonna start with water. And we're gonna start with swimming. Now Loughborough University is famed for its swimmers and so much so that we actually put pictures of them on the wall in our swimming pool. And some of these of course are multiple Olympic champions. But I'm afraid I'm going to burst their bubble a little bit by saying that humans are not actually natural swimmers for a whole host of reasons. The main reasons are, of course, we lack the sort of streamlining you see in aquatic species, and we also have limited propulsion. We don't have a particularly bendy back, and when we use our limbs for propulsion, we really don't have a particularly great catch on the water compared to having fins and flippers. However, we do have a lot of performance data. And so the very best human swimmers can sprint 50 meters at 2.4 meters per second and can swim 10 kilometers over approximately two hours at about 1.5 meters per second. And from the literature, there have been a number of studies done on the speed duration relationship in club swimmers. And typically you see values for critical speed of one to 1.5 meters per second and distance prime of about 30 meters, giving us a, an endurance parameter ratio of 20 to 30 seconds, less than half what we see in running. Now, part of the reason for that, of course, is we're moving through a fluid medium and the faster we move through it, the harder it is, and therefore we use up energy uh, much more quickly. And so that may explain why the, the D prime is not as high as we might expect. Now, how does that compare to fish? Well, you'll be pleased to know that critical speed has actually been measured in fish. And surprisingly, the, the term critical speed was used by fish biologists 20 years before it was ever used in humans. And this comes from the work of Brett in 1964. Brett was working for uh, the Canadian um, fish um, organization, um, so Canadian Fish Research Council um, out of British Columbia. And he set up a swimming flume to measure critical speed. And the way he did it was slightly different to humans and, and slightly more um, hardcore. So they did 75 minute stages. So they'd run this pump at a fixed speed for 75 minutes and see if the fish could maintain that speed. If the fish could, they then increase the speed and see if they could maintain another 75 minutes and keep going for several hours until the fish could no longer maintain the speed through that swimming flume. Now, of course, this swimming flume uh, is about waist height. And so that does limit the size of fish you can put in there. But being in the Pacific Northwest, we're very interested in the performance of trout and salmon, other river, river and um, uh, coastal fish. And so fish of uh, that size, um, you, can, you can get a lot of and therefore measure quite closely and carefully. You can also, of course, have um, lines in there so you can measure the oxygen concentration. Uh, behind the fish so you can look at uh, fish oxygen consumption as well. And when these measurements have been made, we can then start to compare fish against humans. Now, of course, we need to normalize this in terms of body lengths so that we can fairly compare to very different species in terms of size. But fish such as salmon and trout typically have a critical speed of between two and six body lengths per second. That's compared to humans, of approximately 0.8 body lengths per second. So very much faster as you might expect. Not hugely faster. The real difference comes in terms of sprinting speed. And so humans, for a world record 50 meter freestyle, humans will be able to move at 1.3 body lengths per second. Whereas fish, uh, particularly uh, salmon, can achieve up to 10 body lengths per second during burst swimming. Unfortunately, in terms of the speed duration relationship, we don't have any uh, meaningful data on large fish species that you might have heard of, swordfish, sharks, dolphins, etc. 
Um, and they've not been assessed in this way, largely because dolphins in captivity have to swim in laps. And so you never really see their true uh, top speed. But also you can't really uh, get swordfish and sharks to move at the speed you want them to for a fixed uh, duration. But they have been tagged in the wild and the burst speed of a great white shark, i.e. the same shark that uh, was uh, Jaws in the films, is about 6.7 meters per second whilst attacking a seal or 1.6 body lengths per second. That doesn't sound very fast, but it's a lot faster than humans. So I would recommend that if you are in that position, don't try and outswim a great white shark. It's only going to end badly for you and you'll die tired. But how does a fish go about doing this uh, in terms of performance? And the answer is there's, there's a couple of interesting features of fish uh, which help. First of all, the compartmentalization of muscle. So here we have uh, a bank of muscle very close to the spine, which are made up of slow twitch fibers, type one muscle fibers, um, which are used for cruising. So slow swimming speeds uh, are reliance. If you see a, a fish in an aquarium swimming slowly, they're using their slow twitch muscles uh, close to the center of the body. If they want to engage in burst swimming, they will then use their larger fast twitch muscles on the flanks to, to affect that. And that's why if you eat fish in a restaurant, you'll see the white meat on the outside. That's their fast twitch muscle. Fish also have two ways of breathing. So they have the buccal uh, way of breathing or the, the gill way of breathing where they open the mouth and open the gill slits and then aerate the uh, gills in that way, uh, moving water through them actively. And then there's passive or ram ventilation. So as fish reach speeds of uh, between 50 and 80 centimeters per second, they can completely stop breathing. They just hold their mouth open and ram ventilation allows them to reduce the oxygen cost of their breathing by about 20 to 25 percent. If you think about that in humans, one of the best ways of improving performance is to try and um, reduce the oxygen cost of breathing in some way, sometimes artificially, but you can also train the respiratory muscles as well. So that's how the fish do what they do. Now let's take to the air and think about flight. And I'm gonna concentrate on birds because that's what we have the most information for. Um, and flight of course has been an, an important evolutionary advantage. Initially we think for escape, but once you escaped and then managed to stay on the wing, um, you were able to then travel vast distances. The problem with flight is it's very energetically costly to get in the air and stay in the air. Um, but there are advantages that birds have that allow this to happen. Perhaps the main one is the avian lung. Now, in humans and other mammals, we essentially have a bellows-like lung where we breathe in uh, by depressing the diaphragm and using other muscles in support to draw air into the lungs. Um, gas exchange occurs and then we push air back out. In the bird, what they've done with this is separate gas exchange and ventilation. So we have a cranial air sac and a caudal air sac. And what they essentially do is inflate them and deflate both of those simultaneously. And what that allows you to do is essentially flush the lung with fresh air twice per breath. And the, the lung here is called parabronchi. And there's also cross current um, arrangements with the pulmonary capillaries in the bird, which also uh, improves gas exchange across the lung. So the avian lung is superior to the mammalian lung. The flight muscle of birds is also very highly oxidative, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And in some birds, particularly high altitude birds, they have uh, mechanisms that increase oxygen carrying capacity or oxygen carriage at high altitude. And so if you can maintain flight, although the, the energetic costs of achieving flight are very high, in terms of cost per unit distance, or kilometers per milliliter of oxygen, or if you think about it in car terms, miles per gallon, it's actually a very efficient way of getting around. And that's why many migratory species of bird exist. So now let's think about some of the best bird performance performances we can find in the literature. And the, the way we need to do this, of course, is measure energy expenditure in the first place. And here we have, just like in humans, we have a budgie with a face mask and then a line leading off to a gas analyzer. This budgie has been trained to fly in a wind tunnel and 
There have been a number of uh, measurements made um, by uh, Butler over in uh, Birmingham in the UK. And here we have a number of different species flying in a wind tunnel. And power output here is a central, sorry, power input here is essentially oxygen uptake measured in watts per kilo. So at the top here, we have some of the smaller species and at the bottom, some of the larger species. And you can see as airspeed increases in the smaller species, oxygen cost decreases as lift increases and then drag increases and oxygen cost increases further. So there's an optimal flying speed in the hummingbird, in the budgerigar, uh, in the uh, cockatiel, et cetera, and in the starling. As the birds get larger, however, that becomes no longer a problem. So if you look at the bar-headed goose, they've almost got a flat oxygen uptake response to increased speed. And if you look at this a little bit more closely from the work of Ward et al from the Journal of Experimental Biology, you can see from 15 up to 21 meters per second, there's no great change in the oxygen uptake cost of exercise for an increase in speed. Interestingly, this oxygen cost should be put into context. So the uh, 2.8 kilogram bird is exercising about 400 milliliters per minute, or to put it another way, about 170 milliliters per kilogram per minute. So just in order to sustain flights, the bar-headed goose in this case is exercising at the same VO2 max you'd expect from an exercising racehorse exercising maximum. And in terms of high performance uh, work, probably the champion there is the hummingbird. And this is uh, hovering flight. And a nectar dispensing feeder mask has been designed in order to measure oxygen uptake in the uh, hummingbird. So the hummingbird thinks it's getting a feed, but actually what these scientists are doing is measuring oxygen uptake. And they also perform incremental exercise by changing the environment that the bird is flying in by pumping helium into the uh, atmosphere and keeping oxygen uh, concentration the same, you can reduce the air density and therefore make flying more difficult and you produce an incremental test for the bird. Each of these measurements only lasts 20 seconds, but the oxygen uptake is pretty impressive. So if you think about an elite human, at best, you're looking at 80 to 90 milliliters per kilogram per minute at VO2 max. Pronghorn antelope, 300 milliliters per kilogram per minute. The range we've measured in the hummingbird is 600 to 1,000 milliliters per kilogram per minute. And the reason the hummingbird's able to do this in addition to its lungs is that hummingbirds have the highest density of mitochondria in any locomotory muscle or any, in this particular case, flight muscle. So their cells are packed with aerobic power generators. And that's how they can achieve such high oxygen uptakes. Now let's think about how high altitude birds and how they achieve this. And there's recent work here that's actually um, solved a mystery or what, what did appear a mystery beforehand because it was assumed that bar-headed geese were suggested to be capable of flying over Mount Everest. So almost nine kilometers high. Um, and this evidence came from uh, a researcher called, and uh, explorer called Swan, who was in the uh, vicinity of Mount Makalu. Now, Mount Makalu, its peak is about 8,400 metres. Um, but he was actually on a glacier about 3,000 metres below the summit. And he thought he heard geese flying over the summit of Mount Makalu. Now, he thought he heard them, but he was three kilometres away from them. So that's a bit difficult to believe. And it was also at night. So that anecdotal evidence needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. But more recent works by Hawks et al. has actually tagged bar-headed geese and followed their migratory path. And what they've been uh, found is they, they found that geese can fly at between four and 6,000 meters pretty routinely. And this is the track they take. So they've measured them from the southern tip of India all the way to their um, feeding grounds in Mongolia. And this is uh, obviously a considerable distance. It takes them 40 to 50 days to do this. But the interesting thing about these geese is they actually do the Himalayan climb in one seven to eight hour effort. And they achieve this increase in um, altitude up to around about 5,000 meters, um, in partly through uh, physiological adaptation. So they have a single point mutation in their hemoglobin protein sequence 
which effectively left shifts the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, allowing them to load up on oxygen at much lower partial pressures of oxygen than a human would. And that allows them to maintain high rates of oxygen uptake at relatively high altitude. But there are also behavioral aspects to their high altitude flight that helps them as well. They fly at night where the air density is highest, and they also fly over the lowest terrain possible. So they fly at about 100 meters above the ground, um, but they maintain that height no matter what the height of the ground um, in, in absolute terms is. And so as a result of that, they try and fly as low as they possibly can whilst also flying safely. And they also fly in that characteristic V formation. And what that means is the bird uh, behind the first bird is actually flying in the wake vortex of that bird's wing. And that means they have to flap their wings slightly less often. And just like you see in uh, cycling races, those birds will swap around so that no one bird has the burden of leading all the way through. So that's flying at altitude. And that's a very impressive distance to be able to fly. But that's not the ultra distance champion of the animal kingdom. The ultra distance champion is the bar tailed godwit. This is a shorebird um, and it winters in um, New Zealand and it spends its summers in Alaska. And when it wants to get back from Alaska to um, New Zealand, it will fly direct. And this is the track. This is from uh, data from Gil et al in 2009. And you can see their flight paths of tagged bar-tailed godwits. Uh, there's one bar-tailed godwit in here, which flew all the way to the South Island of New Zealand, a distance of in, over 11,400 kilometers in one go. It took eight and a half days, flying at about uh, 1,500 meters off the ground um, and sustaining a flight speed of about 16 meters per second. Now that's pretty quick, but they only fly in this direction. They don't fly back in the same way. So they actually follow the Pacific Rim on the way back. Now, the reason they fly down this way is because they then don't have to worry about predators because nobody's going to, nothing's going to follow them. Um, and they can fly at altitude. They don't have to worry about parasites or viruses or anything like that. But they do have to fatten up considerably in Alaska first. And so they are very, very obese when they first take off, and they are very thin, to put it mildly, when they land. So thin, in fact, they actually also digest their digestive tract and some of their flight muscle to get there. And why they take this path is actually quite interesting and quite pragmatic, because you can see some birds don't make it and end up um, landing on Pac uh, Pacific islands. And that's because they have that option if they do become exhausted they can bug out early. Whereas if they fly and they become exhausted north of the Hawaiian Islands, they really don't have any other options but to land in the sea, which is why they take, partly the reason why they take the uh, Pacific Rim route on the way back, but also they have a tailwind at that time of year to help them get to New Zealand. But the bar-tailed godwit is without doubt the best uh, long distance performer in the animal kingdom. And so where does that leave us? Um, well, we can look at the relative athletic performance across species using the speed duration relationship we've developed in humans. Horses likely have the highest critical speed we've met yet measured. But that's likely to be, be exceeded by the pronghorn antelope. The ghost crab has the highest D prime relative to their critical speed, making them the perfect middle distance runner. Fish possess a very high critical speed, but their major advantage through streamlining and um, fins, etc., is sprint performance versus human swimmers. And birds have extreme aerobic adaptations and the anatomy to match, which means their critical speeds have yet to be measured, but almost certainly significantly exceed the maximal uh, mammalian exercise performance. So birds will exceed mammalian VO2 max before they get anywhere near what would be their critical speed. And at that point, I'd like to say thank you very much for listening.